Zalmoxis is a god who was worshipped in Thrace, just north of what the ancients called the Hellespont and what is now called the Dardanelles. He is one of the most prominent gods to figure in the argument from precedent, the argument put by mythicists that Jesus was a figure developed from earlier mythical gods rather than from the historical biography of a man. His prominence in this argument is due in part to the credibility of the historical record we have of him, and in part to the several parallels that exist between him and Jesus. Most of what we know of him comes from Herodotus' histories, dated around 440 BC. When talking about Darius, the Persian king, Herodotus tells us, Before arriving at the Ista, the first people whom he subdued were the Geti, who believe in their immortality. The Thracians of Salmadesus, and those who dwelt above the cities of Apollonia and Mesembria, the Samiadi and the Nipsians, as they are called, gave themselves up to Darius without a struggle. But the Geti obstinately defended themselves and were forthwith enslaved, notwithstanding that they are the noblest as well as the most just of all the Thracian tribes. The belief of the Geti in respect of immortality is the following. They think that they do not die, but that when they depart this life they go to Zalmoxis, who is called also Gebelesis by some among them. To this god every five years they send a messenger who is chosen by lot out of the whole nation and charged to bear him their several requests. Their mode of sending him is this. A number of them stand in order, each holding in his hand three darts. Others take the man who is to be sent to Zalmoxis, and swinging him by his hands and feet, toss him into the air so that he falls upon the points of the weapons. If he is pierced and dies, they think that the god is propitious to them, but if not, they lay the fault on the messenger who, they say, is a wicked man, and so they choose another to send away. The messages are given while the man is still alive. The same people, when it lightens and thunders, aim their arrows at the sky, uttering threats against the god, and they do not believe that there is any god but their own. I am told by the Greeks who dwell on the shores of the Hellespont and the Pontus that this Salmoxus was in reality a man, and that he lived in Samos, and while there he was the slave of Pythagoras, son of Nisarchus. After obtaining his freedom he grew rich, and leaving Samos returned to his own country. The Thracians at that time lived in a wretched way, and were a poor, ignorant race. Zalmoxis, therefore, who by his commerce with the Greeks, and especially with the one who was by no means their most contemptible philosopher, Pythagoras to wit, was acquainted with the Ionic mode of life, and with manners more refined than those current among his countrymen, had a chamber built, in which from time to time he received and feasted all the principal Thracians, using the occasion to teach them that neither he nor they, his boon companions, nor any of their posterity would ever perish, but that they would all go to a place where they would live for an eye in the enjoyment of every conceivable good. While he was acting in this way and holding this kind of discourse, he was constructing an apartment underground into which, when it was completed, he withdrew, vanishing suddenly from the eyes of the Thracians, who greatly regretted his loss and mourned over him as a dead one. He meanwhile abode in this chamber three full years, after which he came forth from his concealment and showed himself once more to his countrymen, who were thus brought to believe in the truth of what he had told them. Such is the account of the Greeks. I, for my part, neither put entire faith in this story of Zalmoxis and his underground chamber, nor do I altogether discredit it. But I believe Zalmoxis to have lived long before the time of Pythagoras, whether there was ever really a man of the name, or whether Zalmoxis is nothing but a native god of the Getae, I now bid him farewell. As for the Getae themselves, the people who observed the practices described above, they were now reduced by the Persians and accompanied by the army of Darius. Sir Herodotus is giving us two versions of Zalmoxis. One is an account of what Zalmoxians believe that he was a god who received people in the afterlife and who they communicated with by human sacrifice. The other is an account from non-believers about how the cult arose. From this second account we can reasonably infer that there was a belief that Zalmoxis had been a man who taught that people don't die but go to an afterlife. Zalmoxis then disappeared and Thracians greatly regretted his loss. Then when he reappeared it was seen as confirming his message of the afterlife. So the obvious inference is that they thought he had died, and then when they saw him again they thought he had been resurrected. But we know that he had actually been hiding underground, so we know that what they saw and believed to have been resurrected was a flesh and blood man. 
there are other inferences that can be made, though they are perhaps a little more tenuous. The first of these is that their belief in the afterlife gave them a particular strength and courage in battle, so presumably the afterlife was something pleasant and desirable, so maybe somewhat similar to the Christian idea of heaven. Though in fairness, that idea did not develop until long after Jesus had entered the Christian narrative. Another thing that is perhaps more tenuous is that the person chosen to be a human sacrifice could fail in the task by not dying and would therefore be regarded as a wicked man, so another one was chosen. Could this be implying that the desirable afterlife was a reward for righteousness and not for everyone? There are other mentions of Zalmoxis in ancient literature, but they don't really add very much to what we know from Herodotus. Plato makes a passing mention in Charmides. Such, Charmides, I said, is the nature of the charm, which I learned when serving with the army from one of the physicians of the Thracian king Zalmoxis who are to be so skilful that they can even give immortality. This Thracian told me that in these notions of theirs, which I was just now mentioning, the Greek physicians are quite right as far as they go, but Zalmoxis, he added, our king, who is also a god, says further that as you ought not to attempt to cure the eyes without the head, or the head without the body, so neither ought you to attempt to cure the body without the soul. And this, he said, is the reason why the cure of many diseases is unknown to the physicians of the Hellas, because they are ignorant of the whole, which ought to be studied also, for the part can never be well unless the whole is well. Then the Greek geographer Strabo mentions him, writing in 7 BC. For it is said that one of the nation of the Getty, named Zalmoxis, has served Pythagoras, and had acquired with this philosopher some astronomical knowledge, in addition to what he had learned from the Egyptians, amongst whom he had travelled. He had returned to his own country, and was highly esteemed both by the chief rulers and the people, on account of his predictions of astronomical phenomena, and eventually persuaded the king to unite him in the government, as an oracle of the will of the gods. At first he was chosen a priest of the divinity most revered by the Getty, but afterwards was esteemed as a god. And, having retired into a district of caverns, inaccessible and unfrequented by other men, he there passed his life, rarely communicating with anybody except the king and his ministers. The king himself assisted him to play his part, seeing that his subjects obeyed him much more readily than formerly, as promulgating his ordinances with the council of the gods, this custom even continues to our time, for there is always found someone of this character who assists the king in his councils, and is styled as a god by the Getty. Their mountain likewise, where Zalmoxis retired, is held sacred. So Strabo doesn't have quite the same story as Herodotus, but they do both refer to hidden underground living. The main thing we learn from Strabo is that Zalmoxis was still being remembered and presumably worshipped in 7 BC, which makes it much more likely that he was being worshipped contemporary with Jesus' supposed life. So far then, the case for Zalmoxis being a prototype for Jesus seems pretty good. We have an account from a reliable and early historian who long predates Christianity. Therefore, any causal relationship must have been Zalmoxis to Jesus, not the other way around. We have a god who was believed to have preached about the afterlife, then died, and then come back to life after three years in his case, whereas days in Jesus. Further, he went on to lord it over a possibly rather heaven-like afterlife arrangement, and it is possible that admission to this afterlife was dependent on not being wicked. That's quite an impressive set of parallels. We can't work being a saviour into it, but this was not a universal view of Jesus by the first Christians either. Some of these parallels are more impressive than others. Dying and then reappearing after three years is quite impressive. Being in charge of the afterlife is less so, as that is such a common job for gods. So with that handful of parallels, to have a fair chance of finding such a match by random coincidence, we're going to need a lot of gods. A few tens won't do it. A hundred or more might do. This brings us to the circumstantial evidence linking Zalmoxis to the founding of Christianity. Zalmoxis was from Thrace, and according to Strabo, was still from Thrace around 7 BC. We have no evidence that he spread anywhere else. That's quite a long way from Judea, and we have no other evidence to link Zalmoxis with the Levant region, and in particular he's not mentioned in Jewish scripture. So this means that we do have a lot of gods who share his circumstantial evidence, and so who to select from. 
I'm not going to attempt to derive formal probabilities, but looking at it qualitatively, it looks to me as though there is a large enough number of gods who fit the same circumstantial evidence as Zalmoxis to make a purely random coincidence credible. It's easy to see why Zalmoxis is such a favourite of mythicists, but I find the argument far from convincing. This means two things. Firstly, I do not think the case is adequately made that Jesus was based on Zalmoxis. And secondly, neither do I think the case is adequately made that both Jesus and Zalmoxis were based on an ancient third factor, that being a fashion at the time for making dying and rising gods.